goals and just about everything else. Jock Brown is the commentator. Falkirk manager Jim Jeffries makes no changes from Saturday's team, and that's a very experienced lineup. Only Gary Smith, who'll be at right back, hasn't played for another senior professional club. Alec Taylor began his senior career at Dundee United before moving to Hamilton Ackies and Walsall. He signed for Falkirk earlier this season and adds creative craft to their midfield. John Lambie, the Thistle manager, also sends out exactly the same team, but it too is full of seasoned professionals. Although their youngest player, 20-year-old Declan Roach, starts only his second match for Thistle following his recent transfer from Celtic. And Falkirk will be paying particular attention to another former Celtic player, David Elliott, whose pace and skill caused the defence lots of problems on Saturday, and he has started to interest some big clubs in England. And the match referee tonight, Mr David Syme from Rutherglen, one of our most experienced officials. Well, the kickoff had to be delayed to allow the huge crowd to enter Brockville tonight. Certainly a crowd into five figures, it would appear, and generating a tremendous atmosphere. It really is just like old times again here at Falkirk. And a fascinating cup tie in prospect. A real battle between these two clubs on Saturday, and it's Thistle who started well with that corner kick again on the far side. And a signal instant play for the big men to come from the back, Trent Tierney and Gordon Ray. So some early work perhaps for Gordon Marshall, the Falkirk goalkeeper. And a fine head right across the face of the goal from Tierney. He got up very well to that, the former Dunfermline centre-half. Helped on by Stainrod McGibbon going through the middle. So we saw him score a hat trick in sports scene against Airdrie earlier in the season. So the playing pattern now settling down with Falkirk operating a back four, which has Gary Smith at right back, Crawford Patty and John Hughes at centre defence, Tom McQueen at left back. McQueen going to face Buckley. This cue there by Taylor, but coming to no harm for Falkirk. So a clash there between Stainrod and Law, and the free kick goes to Falkirk. So the Simon Stainrod, the Falkirk skipper, a major threat to the Thistle defence tonight. Bapti playing it across. Here's Tom McQueen. McGibbon trying to run away there from Gordon Ray. He was held up by the Thistle centre half, so it's a free kick to Falkirk. So Falkirk's midfield four with Heatherston on the right, Cody and Taylor in the middle. McWilliams on the left, leaving McGibbon up front with Stainrod. It's Taylor who'll take the free kick. Right towards the far post, there's a fine challenge and the save from Cammy Duncan. John Hughes. So a superb effort by Hughes, wearing number nine, playing in centre back, but up for this free kick, taken in beautifully there by Taylor. Hughes getting up so well, and that's a magnificent save from Duncan. Well, Thistle will be very concerned about that. The way in which Hughes got the better of their big defence. He's trying again, beaten this time by Gordon Ray. Taylor trying to release Stainrod on the left. But a goal kick to Thistle. Well, Taylor's free kick caused all the problems there, but a huge debt due there to Cammy Duncan in the Thistle goal. Hughes doing well in the air once again. There's Buckley. Back towards Duffy. Complete conviction there in that challenge from Duffy. Heather finds Buckley supported well by Robertson. Good backtracking work there by Derek McWilliams, who's unhappy about the fact that the throw goes to Thistle. John Buckley trying to force his way forward on the right. Well, that 
racing experienced player for Thistle there's McLashen making for the byline and a fine tackle by Hughes A fine start to the match, John Hughes in both penalty boxes. Former Swansea City player. Oh, yeah. by Elliott. And Marshall had to be careful. It was good goalkeeping. He looked very calm indeed, Gordon Marshall. He turned that over, knew exactly what he was doing. So variation here from Thistle. Played in by Elliott. Yeah, the shooting chance for Campbell. And Marshall did well. He's under pressure all the way from McLashen. What a major investment he was by Falker. He cost £65,000 when he was transferred from his wife in 1987. Tierney's header. McLashen doing well. Just turning back to there as the ball was in the air. Here's Elliott. Faced by Taylor. Now Roach. Oh, very crisp strike by Declan Roach. The Republic of Ireland on the 21 international. Saw his chance here. Fully 25 yards. And that wasn't far from Marshall's left hand post. Uh, McWilliams header, oh, this is McGiven. McWilliams again, running at Robertson. Forced to turn back as Buckley comes to help in the fence. With Roach again. Well won by Hughes in the air. Queen closed down very quickly indeed by Roach. Cody's return pass to McQueen. Williams switching the play well to the far side. This is Henderson. Smith goes on the outside. This is Taylor. Fine play by Taylor. Well, he has a lovely touch on the ball, Alec Taylor. And he made that shooting chance for himself. Well, he took the pass. Look at the way he sidestepped Jim Duffy. That's not an easy task. And the left foot shot was certainly troublesome. This is Cody. Now Henderson. Stan Rudd, flashing there with Tierney. That's good play by Elliott. He may go all the way himself to the middle. They appear to be caught there by Smith. There was a trip by the Falcon youngster. Well, there's going to be the first booking of the match for Gary Smith. Well, he was clearly concerned about the pace of Elliott. There was a gap opening up there for the Thistle number 11. That was a trip which resulted in the yellow card. goes to Thistle. Bobby Law in a hurry. Just like every other player on the pitch it would appear tonight. Stain Rod is caught offside. Well I reckon if there was some calculation of how much actual time had been played with the ball on the field of play in the opening 35 minutes I reckon you'd have a very high percentage indeed. It's for great entertainment for the big crowd. There goes McGibbon. He's caught there by Law. It's a free kick to Falkirk. I think Taylor will have to take that again. Law explaining himself there to McGibbon. Back to the Taylor. That's fine play again from Taylor, looking for the return pass. Alec Taylor running all the way, and what a magnificent tackle that was from Jim Duffy. Frustration there for Taylor. It was creative play in this hectic atmosphere of top-class ability. And there's the header. They made it in the end. Ball cut begin the celebrations, and Sam McGibbon, who breaks the deadlock. It was... The ball played in very rapidly near the crowded penalty area. McGiven was first to the ball, and that powerful header left Duncan helpless.
Bucks. Smith laying it up to safety. Well, Falkirk again have asserted themselves, particularly in the middle of the field where the creative work has come from Taylor. He's added that little touch of class in that area of the field, which has made a vital difference. Oh, that's good play by Buckley. Trying to get to the byline. And the referee's given the penalty kick. John Hughes has been penalised. Well, the Falkirk players clearly believe that Buckley did that deliberately and played for the penalty. But he certainly was making for the byline here. And as he did so, it was impeded there by Hughes. It was a rash tackle. Well, it may look as though it's a soft penalty kick. Buckley getting some verbal abuse there from Hughes. And making a lot of that. But, well, you have the impression that that happened on the halfway line. It would have been a foul. And that means the penalty kick is justified. And a chance now for Duffy. side of the crossbar well Jim Duffy looks for half the coolest player on the field as he puts Thistle back in level terms well he only just made it off the bar Marshall certainly had no chance at all the tempers have certainly risen Falkirk feeling a very heavy sense of injustice about that award and Sam McGibbon has said the one or two too many he's going to be booked for descent. Well, that really is an act of folly by McGibbon. He wasn't going to change anything with that little outburst towards referee sign. So he's been shown the yellow card. And Falkirk, who appeared to have things going all their own way, now have to try to win the match all over again. Duffy in the thick of the action again. And Roach. Gary Smith getting back. Another heavy tackle on Elliott. The referee says a goal kick, though. So Roach writhing in agony in the middle of the field. The referee oblivious to that. Well, the tackling is getting tougher by the second now. Simon Stainrod on the floor, the referee Simon having a war with his linesman Alan Seaton from Kilmarnock well, Simon Stainrod have finished up the victim started off in the eyes of the linesman as the original culprit and now it's Bobby Law who will be in trouble well now the Falkirk fans are looking for the Thistle fullback to be ordered off. There's a long explanation here as the red card for Law. Retaliation on Simon Stainrod. And Thistle are reduced to ten men. John Lambie speaking to Law. Thistle manager clearly upset. Looking to Bobby Law for some explanation perhaps. his long free kick and it's going to be Thistle who'll have to reorganise for the second half with only ten men referee Syme brings the activities of the most incredible 45 minutes to an end at half time Falk at one, Martin Thistle one the huge crowd in the stadium are buzzing throughout the interval there following all the action in the first half opinions of all kinds about the controversial matters, the penalty kick to Barry Thistle, then the ordering off of Bobby Law on the half-time whistle. But what is absolutely certain is that everyone here at Rockville relishes a prospect of the second half. So Thistle with a major problem of coping with only 10 men in the ranks. They've had time at half-time to consider their tactics for this start of the second period so we'll see what John Lambie has come up with Falkirk will be trying to keep the pressure on right from the start of this half and Peter Heatherston there getting a lot 
Cut throw goes to Thistle. And a back came from McGlashan. Elliott has dropped back and would appear to left back, replacing Bobby Law. So he started his Thistle career at left back, so he's no stranger to that position, but they will miss him in attack because he was a potent threat, all right. The space for McQueen. Stain Rod trying to control it. There's McGibbon! He's done it again! The second minute of the second half. Jubilation once again for the Baltic supporters. Tom McQueen sent the ball across. This is a bit thin at the back now. And now, of course, the drop from Stain Rod to McGibbon and the volley left Duncan helpless. This is Elliot. Well, he'll have a double tour in the second half, David Elliot. He's got to fill in the left back position and try to get forward as much as he can. He was fouled there all right. This will have a free kick. Taken quickly by Roach. This is Duffy. Now Buckley forcing Smith to play the ball out. still struggling a little bit he took a knock just before half time requiring treatment Elliot's throw there's Duffy oh McLashen making for the byline that's a fine effort it came off the post from Callum Campbell and Gordon Marshall appearing at a touch there that was magnificent goalkeeping. The ball pulled back superbly by McGlashan. Campbell's header and turned it behind in fact by Marshall. Well, he didn't need the post to help him. Well, that could turn out to be a crucial save. Here's Buckley with the corner. Well won by Bapti under pressure from Tierney. There's Duffy. trying to keep the ball in play. Managed that, only for the benefit of Gordon Ray, though. And goes Buckley, and this time, referee Syme is not deceived by the dive. He's given a throw to Falkirk. No, indeed, he has given the free kick. It looked as though he was allowing Falkirk to have the throw, but... On the view that Buckley was caught in that tackle. for Buckley again. This is Robertson. Flashing playing it back. Now it's with Duffy. Elliot calls the ball on the left. Oh, superb play by Elliot. And the equaliser for Partick Thistle. It's turned in by McLashan. But the creative work done by David Elliott. Now this is play of the highest class from David Elliott. Look at the way he skipped past these defenders. Then angled the ball across the bows of Gordon Marshall. It came off the post and McLashan was there with a the finish. Well, David Elliott been asked to perform Heroics on the left flank of Barry Thistle, and he certainly has delivered. McGlashan's seventh goal of the season. Great play by McWilliams. This is promising for Falkirk. 
forced wide by Robertson. Queen playing it in. And a good first time effort. Caught there well from Taylor by Duncan. Hughes again to attack the ball in the air. This is McLashen. Robertson. Good running by Buckley. Followed by Batty. Buckley's got the better of him. Still Buckley in possession. Setting up the shooting chance for Roach. And for the first time in the match, Thistle are ahead. Well, John Buckley did superbly here, holding on the strength of Batty then showing delightful close control beating Hughes, setting it up for Roach and that shot leaving Gordon Marshall stranded well you have to hand it to Patrick Thistle, they've shown so much commitment and determination played wide by Stainrod that was an excellent pass this is McGiven rifling in the cross met well inside the box by Tierney now Cody has possession. Stainrod setting it up for Taylor. He's had a number of shots at goal tonight, Alec Taylor. Still no luck, but this was well created for him by Simon Stainrod. The pass there across the face of the goal intended, I think, for Cody, but it reached Stainrod. Taylor lashed the ball away. Ten minutes for Falkett to save the tie and put it into extra time. Play by Hughes. Stainrod. Now Heatherston. Smith coming up from the right back position. Trying to outpace Buckley. Turned out in the end by Elliott. This will want to make a substitution. The referee is not prepared to hold up play at the moment. McQueen, the fine effort, looking for his first goal for Falkirk, it couldn't have been more welcome by that got in, but Cammy Duncan brings up a great save, Declan Roach, clearly will be disappointed with that clearance, but look at the way it's collected by McQueen, he's just one thought in mind, dipping in on the lacrosse bar, and Duncan made a good save. Falkirk piling on the pressure now We're inside the closing 10 minutes. Played in by Taylor. Hughes is in the box. It's out to Bapti. Heatherston playing it in. Uh, lucky there with that clearance. Could easily have fallen straight to a Falkirk player. Bapti to Heatherston. Williams, he's away from Tierney. Taken out late. The referee contend, I think, simply to give the free kick. He knows that well Tierney got there as quickly as he could. And us into the far post. Out to Taylor. And another fine effort from Taylor. They must be wondering what he has to do to find the net. The ball came out, he chested it down well on the half volley with the left foot. Still no luck in front of goal. Here goes Bapti. Luffy plays it forward, but Gavin is offside. The referee has now spotted the far side linesman. He should take it quickly by Bapti. No time to waste for Falkirk. And it comes from McQueen. Here's John Hughes. Well, you still have the feeling there's more drama to unfold tonight. It's been a match in the best Scottish Cup traditions. And is there more to come? Falkirk certainly hope so. Chilling by three goals to two. Heatherston coming across the edge of the penalty area. 
McGiven waiting on the left touchline. There goes the cross, it's helped on, in goes Finrod. Well, now, was he taken out by Elliott? That's the question. Corner kick's been given, Stainrod reckons he was bumped as the ball was in midair. And I wonder if the referee had seen it from this angle, they may have had a different view. There's the header. to take the pass he invited to go inside by Robertson but appears to be determined to go on the outside it helps to waste some more time kept in by Robertson was it? no, the ball was out of play throw to Fissel oh, ball cut supporters eyes on referee sign Unbelievable cup tie, wasn't it? And obviously greatly enjoyed by that massive crowd at Brockville. And uh, Thistle down to ten men, as Jock says, very nearly hung on for victory. But uh, of the seven goals, several of them outstanding goals as well. But it's Falkirk in the end to go through to Fir Park to beat Motherwell in the next round. Well, after the match, Jock spoke to the Falkirk manager, Jim Jeffries. Jim, it was an incredible cup tie. What was it like for you watching from the sidelines as the manager? Well, it's unbelievable. We were really, really draining uh, after that experience. Uh, I played in a cup tie quite a few years ago down at uh, Somerset Park for the Hearts, and uh, I thought that was a, an experience I'd never relive again, but I did it all over the night again. It was a fantastic uh, atmosphere, and what a game. Was. You just couldn't ask for any better. Now you're 3-2 down, a little over five minutes to go. Did you think you were out? Well, I was quite happy the boys didn't resort to thumping balls into the, into the box. And, uh, you know, we kept playing it on the deck. We kept trying to get it out wide. And though, you know, one or two fans can moan that we're not getting it forward, it's that patience that came right at the end because, uh, you know, they've got to work and chase. And if there's a man shot, um, and then when you can hit the telling ball in, they just, you know, you, you, you make up with that uh, extra man. But uh, certainly I'll leave it late. I always thought maybe the game could go into extra time. But... Uh, you know, they're a great, they're a great spirit there, as you've as you seen, and uh, great character. 
We've come from behind and uh, uh, nothing but praise for them. We had two men who scored two goals. You had, first of all, Sam McGovern and then Derek McWilliams. Did you think they were key men? Or what was the key factor for you in the game? Well, you know, we went early this afternoon and uh, we went through a couple of routines with the, with the corner kicks and, uh, you know, playing it short and then getting the ball whipped in with Tommy. And it's great when you, you score a goal that you've just worked on on the training ground. And, uh, you know, Sam's always dangerous in and around about there. And I felt that we got... Uh, better balls into the box and uh, you know their goalkeeper early doors didn't come for him he had made one great save to John Hughes so when he's not going to come off his line you've got to you know make sure that uh, you get balls in and it causes him a lot of problems when defenders think well he's not coming puts me under a lot of pressure and, and I thought that was the, 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 the uh, telling factor tonight you know but uh, great spirit uh, as I said and uh, we played a lot of good good football and as, as this part of Christmas it was a cracking cup tie. It certainly was. Well, uh, Gordon Smith and I certainly enjoyed it. Uh, Gordon, what, uh, what would you say about that? That uh, was just a tremendous match, really, wasn't it? It was a great game. Yeah. I loved it from beginning to the end. Mm. I, I agree with Jim Jeffries, what he said there about the fact that Falkirk continued to play football despite the fact they were in the last five minutes and they were 3-2 down. And uh, that's all credit to them. How significant do you think was the sending off of Bobby Law? Because apart from the fact it left Thistle with ten men, sometimes it's actually more difficult to play against ten men, isn't it? Uh, well, we're used to playing with 10 men over the last few weeks, so <laughs> um, it is very difficult to play against 10 men because the, they can really tighten the game up. You can just see it in the very corner of the picture there, the, the tussle between Simon Stainrod and, and Law, and you, you see they, they go down together, but uh, You can't really see it properly. It's hard to tell, ad admittedly, in, in, in that picture, but uh, he went and it was just uh, a minute before half-time. John Lambie clearly wasn't pleased. There it is again. No, it's very annoying. When one of your players gets sent off, mm -hmm. especially in a vital game like that, mm -hmm. you can get very upset about it because obviously you're down to 10 men and it's going to be an uphill struggle. If it goes into extra time, players will tire more easily as well if there's only 10. Mm -hmm. Although, right. having said that, Thistle weathered the storm and came out very strong in the second half. Just a, a quick word, we're looking at the big meeting tomorrow as regards reconstruction. Falkirk and Thistle, obviously two of the sides that will be looking for a place in, in the Premier Division. Uh, on the evidence you've seen, would there be a... A well, welcome addition? Certainly, these teams deserve a place. You can see there's not much difference in the standard between that level and what's in the Premier League. Great. OK, Gordon, thanks for the moment. Let's turn our attention now to the Cup favourite. Brockville, where two of the other serious promotion candidates, Falkirk and Hamilton, met. And as we hear from commentator Ken McRobb, they provided a match of great entertainment and goals. Falkirk without Andy Nichol, who's suffering with a thigh strain. 34-year-old Brian Whitaker takes his place. Peter Godfrey comes in for the suspended John Hughes and Sam McGiven also out through suspension. Seven of that starting 11 were signed by manager Jim Jeffries. And there's one of them, Tommy McQueen, back in Scotland after his time at Upton Park, previously with Clyde and then, of course, Aberdeen. He's made a valuable contribution to Falkirk, a defender who likes coming forward. And making his debut today, Peter Godfrey. He signed at 10 past 11 last Saturday morning. Five minutes later, Falkirk's game was postponed. So he's had to wait a week before making his first appearance. A free transfer from St Mirren. He's been given the rest of the season to prove himself. No change in the Hamilton side from the team that beat Meadowbank Thistle 2-1 on Wednesday to put them fourth in the table. Hamilton still without the injured Colin Harris and Hugh Burns, a significant loss to a club with limited resources. One of the most experienced members of the Douglas Park squad is former Hibs and Celtic striker George McCluskey. Still scoring goals, he's hit 13 this season and he scored against Falkirk on his Hamilton debut. And there's the man Hamilton have to thank for putting them back in the top four of the first division. Craig Napier scored both the goals in the Yankees 2-1 win over Meadowbank in midweek to bring his season's tally to four. The game off and running as Falkirk push down the left of the field. Second place Falkirk against full top Hamilton. Hamilton have only lost one league match here since 1983. They beat Falkirk 1-0 on the opening day of the season. But to balance things, Falkirk managed a 2-0 victory at Douglas Park last November. Throw then to Hamilton. A good Falkirk crowd in the stadium this afternoon. Not as much football going on in Scotland as normal, so the first division gates have swelled just a little. Free kick taken. Good play there by Paul McDonald. Out on the left, Craig Napier in goal scoring form. Tries an effort too, and that's just over the top of the bar. 
Gordon Marshall watched it as went over, but a good effort by Craig Napier. Well, he scored four goals already this season, and he did get those two against Meadowbank. Lovely ball through. Napier always ready to take a chance when he sees one. He just looked up, saw a gap, and had a go. But goalkeeper Marshall having it covered in any event. Chance for Falkirk to strike forward again. Simon Stainrod, man of many clubs, coming forward himself, tries a shot. A low one and a good save by Alan Ferguson. Stainrod always dangerous coming forward. When he plays, Falkirk play. And here he goes again. He shrugs off the tackle, looks up, can't find a player, sees the opportunity, and a good save by the goalkeeper. Kevin McKee. Ball headed on by Stainrod. Miller will get there first. Throw taken, and it comes from Taylor. Looking for someone in the box to take advantage, but no one there. Gary Smith takes it on the chest. Stainrod, good play again. He sees the chance and a shot, and a great save once again by Alan Ferguson. Well, Steinrod obviously has got a shoot on sight policy this afternoon. The ball played inside to him. Once more, he beat his player, looked up, had a go, but once again, Alan Ferguson was equal to it. Plenty of space for Colin Miller. Ball stays down the left. Back it is with Miller. Thing being channeled through him at the moment, he gets the cross in too. And McCluskey watched that one go over his head, and it had beaten Duffy. And those two challenging again. The ball going out for a corner, George McCluskey. Top scorer of Hamilton this season. And up comes James Weir to cause some trouble, or attempt to at least. For Falkirk, Hamilton centre half inside the box. As McDonald takes the kick, that one's headed in the air by McQueen. Whitaker's under it, he doesn't get there first, and that's off the bar! What a chance! Raymond McGuigan with the shot. And my goodness, that certainly was close. The corner came in, it was just never cleared. And a half effort certainly had the goalkeeper Gordon Marshall flummoxed. Back off the woodwork. Edderston no good from the challenge by Weir. Lovely ball to McDonald. McDonald takes on and beats Gary Smith. Chips that one over the head. And oh, that was an essential save by Gordon Marshall. That would have crept in at the back post. A bit of quick thinking there by Paul McDonald. He beat his man, saw the keeper off the line, chipped that one. It would have crept in. But a touch there by Marshall. And Falkirk saved. Here comes McDonald again with an effort. That one bounces awkwardly. Just past the post. Marshall got down to it. Got a touch to it as well. But underneath his body. And once again, Paul McDonald proving just what a difficult player he is to try and control. He saw the chance. And just past the post. And there's David Holmes, chairman of Falkirk, former chief executive of Rangers, of course, now with his hometown team. Gordon Marshall with the clearance downfield. Eddie May nods that one on, chested down by Heatherston. Here's May again. Keeper Taylor finds him back to May. Now Steinrod gets into the act. Duffy, good possession play by Falkirk, but time running out before the half-time whistle. Here's Mick Williams. Good tackle by McKee. McQueen with the cross. Stainrod's there. Then it comes inside the penalty area. Stainrod with a chip back across the face of the goal! And Falkirk have broken the deadlock. Eddie May, the scorer, at the back post. And what a sensational time to open the scoring. It all started with a cross from Tommy McQueen on the left. Waiting at the back post was Simon Stainrod. He took his time, the ball went past him. Took it to the byline, the chip across the face of the goal. And waiting there 
was Eddie May to score right on 45 minutes. So Hamilton lose a goal at the worst possible time. Miller at the back. Now Millen. And there goes the halftime whistle. Hamilton really just didn't have an opportunity to get themselves back into the game because the goal came so late. But a good goal by Eddie May and Falkirk lead at halftime by one goal to nil. So Hamilton kick off the second half, trailing by that Eddie May goal scored in the last minute of the first 45. But the Douglas Park Club have a good record here. They've only lost once in the league since 1983. Can they get back? It's Falkirk, though, who come forward first. The header by Andy Rillen, almost catching his goalkeeper out. But Alan Ferguson recovering, and a smile on the face there of Andy Millen. No real danger. And an anxious moment, certainly, as the ball came over. Millen's header. And I don't think that's quite what he expected Alan Ferguson to be. Ball falls for Taylor, now Stainrod. Neil Duffy. Jamie McWilliams. Takes on McCabe and beats him. McWilliams goes to the edge of the penalty area. Still in possession. Now McQueen with a low cross. Oh, and that one just goes past the post. It was James Weir who came in. He got a touch and it's gone behind for a corner. But my goodness, how close that was. McWilliams does all the hard work. McQueen gets the cross in. And Weir takes that one on the leg. And it just darts past the post for a corner. Stainrod and the policeman exchanging pleasantries. Takes the corner. That one's headed out. Only to Alec Taylor. A good effort by him. And that's just past the post, too. Alec Taylor. Signed for Walsall for 30,000. Watched the ball as it came across from the corner. The clearance came out. He came in and struck it first time. And that wasn't far past the post of Alan Ferguson. A chance for Hamilton perhaps to hit with a break as McDonald certainly gets that one well past Gary Smith. Still McDonald. Takes on Taylor, gets the better of him too. Plays it inside. McCabe leaves it. Everyone leaving it to everybody else to have the go though. And it goes to the left again, McDonald's cross, waiting as George McCluskey, that one's off the woodwork, and behind it goes, did it take a touch off Gordon Marshall, it appears to, because it'll be a corner, the high cross to the back, no one marking George McCluskey, and his effort down there off the woodwork and behind, the touch off the goalkeeper. Here's Napier on the left for Hamilton, couldn't quite find Miller, and now a chance for Falkirk to hit Hamilton in the break, Stainrod. Gary Smith, Falkirk coming forward in force. Taylor, Hamilton Williams, cross into the centre, a chance and a goal by Peter Heddleston. Heddleston celebrates his return to the first team with a goal brilliantly constructed. 61 minutes gone, Falkirk now lead by two goals to nil. And it, a wonderful move, a lovely ball through there by Taylor. McWilliams immediately onto it, looked up, and there was Heatherston to finish beautifully past Alan Ferguson. And on the bench, well, not perhaps the delight you might expect from the Falkirk team. McQueen across the halfway line. Heatherston is past those cut out by Kevin McKee. Key in turn loses out, and referee says play on as Heatherston goes down. And Kevin McKee takes the opportunity to spray the ball left. Not a good one, though. It's easily cut out by Gary Smith. Alec Taylor on a run. Gives it wide to May. Now Stainrod. James Weir's with him. Stainrod simply stops on the ball. A lovely piece of skill. Cheeky and clever, Stain run again, this time the back heel of the ball across the face of the goal, but cut out by McGee. And Simon Stainrod playing to the crowd. Lovely bit of play, he just chipped that ball cheekily back. And when he got the return, the back heeler. McGee's there for Hamilton to stop it. Paul McDonald, because of space for Raymond McGuigan on the right. 
Whitaker comes across, McGuigan gets the cross in, and that was not far away at all. I think Gordon Marshall perhaps misjudged that one. The ball swung out to the right by McDonald, and McGuigan looked up. I don't know whether he meant that one or not, but certainly goalkeeper Marshall misjudged it. Overhead kick by Paul McDonald. Chested down by Godfrey. He slipped though, and that's given McCluskey half a chance. But well recovered by Peter Godfrey. Gets the ball back for full kick. Stain run again. Miller goes with him. A lovely ball through McWilliams. It chases on. Can he beat the keeper? Down he goes. Alan Ferguson, without doubt, pulled down Derek McWilliams. And it could be the red card for Alan Ferguson. The professional foul. It wasn't handball. He did what he thought he had to. Well, that's the way he'll look at it anyway. McWilliams there. Definitely no doubt about that. And it could be the end of the game for Alan Ferguson. Simon Stainwood going across to intervene and try and persuade Hugh Williamson that perhaps it shouldn't be, but it is. And the end of the match for Alan Ferguson. And the question now is who's going to go and go? Colin Miller, I think, will take the jersey. And a sad end for Ferguson as he leaves the field. Well, here's the test. 19 yards out. Steinrod and Taylor stand over the ball. Colin Miller's in goal. Taylor strikes it just over the top. Well, Colin Miller watched that one as Taylor's effort went over. Shipped over the wall, but just too high. And I think Colin Miller can justifiably claim he had it covered anyway. Andy Millen for Hamilton. Down to ten men and trailing by two goals to nil. It's a lot to ask for them to come back now. And putting themselves in trouble there as Eddie May takes it away for Falkirk. Toss it in the middle. Not a good one. Gets a second chance and he still can't get it over. May with a third opportunity to Taylor. Tries to set up Mick Williams, a shot comes in and a save by Colin Miller. Well, that'll give him some confidence. The first touch for Miller since taking over in goal from Alan Ferguson. Good move too, but Williams did well to get the effort in in the first instance. Taylor sets him up for it, and the shot well saved by Miller. Well, that one's given away. Here's Derek Mick Williams going through in his own. He's got support from Stainrod. Chip by him into the centre. Here comes Taylor with the header through the legs of Colin Miller, and Alec Taylor celebrates right on 90 minutes. It was given away by Hamilton, and Falkirk certainly punished him for that. Mick Williams takes the ball through, plays the ball up to Stainrod. He just settles himself, sees Taylor on the run coming in at the far post, and a downward header through the legs of Colin Miller. And out of the net, perhaps, but a goal it stood. Well, certainly no time for Hamilton now, because there goes the full-time whistle. Falkirk have beaten Hamilton comprehensively, and that will do them a lot of good. Alec Taylor, the scorer of the third goal just seconds ago. Simon Stainrod, for my money, certainly man of the match. He set up that third one, always prepared to have a go, and his experience so valuable for Falkirk as ever. And so the full-time score here at Brockville. Falkirk 3, Hamilton 0. Simon, a good win, but I think as important, a good confidence booster. Yes, I think in the second half we showed what we can do, and uh, you know the dressing room's really effervescent now, and uh, you know, we're really pleased with the results, especially the second half performance. The other top teams won too, so you haven't really gained any advantage. But how do you feel Falkirk are sitting as they go towards the end of the, the season? Well, obviously it's important uh, today's result uh, because as the two other teams won, who were you know closest to us, and so uh, you know with ten games to go, it's all to play for, 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 for basically for the top three, I think. Yeah, but uh, you know it's all to play for, and we, we're in there battling. Not just a good result, but a good performance, as you say, particularly in that second half, mm -hmm. and a great second goal. What do you remember of it? Well, I can remember it was giving a corner away, I think, carelessly, and I was a bit annoyed about that. And then uh, they took the corner, it was, it was cleared, the ball came up to me, I played a ball out to Alec Taylor here. Uh, he knocked the ball in the inside right channel for Derek Williams, who took it wide, whipped the ball in, and Peter Heddleston took it away. 
a class goal, really, a tremendous goal. Beautiful way to disclaimed if I may say so too. The question you're always asked: Are you still enjoying your football up in Scotland? Uh, well, I mean, just for yourself, I, I think uh, I think I showed up. Today, Rangers lost another player, their fifth sent off in the last three games, but gained another two points as the title race enters its last lap. Aberdeen kept up the chase at Easter Road on Easter weekend, but could be without keeper Theo Snelders for the rest of the season. Then there's the first division. It was a small screen classic the last time they met. Adrian Falkirk didn't disappoint this time either. And here's Sam McGibbon with an excellent chance for the second, going all the way himself. And a good save by John Martin. And Doherty Hardy, the fight of the night, as Scotland's amateur boxers slug it out in Grangemouth. After two old firm defeats in seven days, could Rangers get their championship defence back on the rails? Gary Stevens made sure they did with the only goal at Dunfermline for the 10-man Ibrox sides. After last week's late winner at Tannadice, Hans Hillhouse did the trick again for Aberdeen, a hat-trick against Hibbs. And Tom Boyd was a scorer as Motherwell beat Celtic in a Tenant Scottish Cup semi-final dress rehearsal. But while Aberdeen maintained their pursuit of leaders Rangers in the championship, there was worrying injury news twice over. Keeper Theo Snelders, who's already missed a big chunk of the season through injury, dislocated his shoulder today and he could be out for the rest of the season. Skipper Alec McLeish was also taken to hospital in Edinburgh with what was at first feared to be a broken ankle. Now it seems it might not be quite that serious. Derek, that doesn't help Aberdeen. Well, it's disaster for Alex Smith, isn't it? I think Alex McLeish is having a magnificent season, and uh, we saw last week at Tannadice how Theo Snelders is playing, so that'll be disaster for Aberdeen. And they've already, of course, been without Snelders for a good portion of the season, yeah. and it doesn't help. It doesn't help. Uh, he's saved Aberdeen on many occasions, and uh, this could be the end of Aberdeen's title hopes, I'm afraid, Rob. Aberdeen unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly are, yeah. So Aberdeen keeping up the pressure on Rangers and Hans Heelhouse was their star man today with a hat-trick against Hibbs at Easter Road. Scott Booth scored for the Dons as well. Gareth Evans and Brian Hamilton made it 4-2. The goal that mattered for Rangers at Dunfermline, the only one, came from Gary Stevens. Ian Ferguson was sent off. In the Cup semi-final rehearsals, goals from Tom Boyd and Ian Ferguson, the other one, gave Motherwell victory at Celtic Park after Tommy Coyne had scored first. Dundee United and St Johnston were inseparable in a goalless draw at Tannadice. Davy Hay got a home draw with Hearts in his first match as St Mirren manager, but saw striker Steve Archibald sent off. Well, our featured action tonight comes from the first division. Every time we've dropped down a league this season, we've struck gold. And Falkirk's Sam McGivern certainly doesn't complain when our cameras turn up. He got a glorious hat-trick the last time his team went to Broomfield to play promotion rivals Airdrie. And Sam wasn't camera shy today, and we went back for a second helping. Commentating, Jock Brown. Airdrie manager Jimmy Bone makes one enforced change from the team which drew at Hamilton last week. Davy Kirkwood, who was ordered off, is suspended but Graham Harvey is fit to resume. And a major threat to Falkirk will be Owen Coyle. Signed from Clyde Bank for £165,000 last season, he scored 17 goals in seven games at the start of the season, but has added only one since his return from a serious knee injury. Jim Jeffries, the Falkirk manager, also makes one change. Peter Heatherston reverts to the bench to allow the highly rated young defender Gary Smith to return at fullback. And Airdrie may well still have nightmares about Sam McGivern. The former Kilmarnock striker scored a hat-trick before television cameras on his last visit to Broomfield, and he's taken his total to 16 goals for the season. The referee this afternoon, Mr George Smith from Edinburgh, who handled the Celtic against Rangers match on Sunday, and will be involved in the Scottish Cup semi-final tie between Dundee United and St Johnston next week. So a perfect Easter setting for this Vitally important first division promotion clash. Falkirk starting the game and anxious to get forward straight away. Coming here, of course, with no suggestion of doing anything other than going for victory. That was made clear before the match by their manager, Jim Jeffries. And the 
and have the memory of that 3-1 victory here at Broomfield earlier in the season to inspire them. So a free kick there given to Falkirk. No, the throw is given. There's some confusion there as the left did a word with one of the early players. So Tommy McQueen taking this throw for Falkirk. One of several new arrivals in the regime of Jim Jeffries. One who served the club so well. A good challenge by Godfrey, another newcomer in the Falkirk ranks. As Owen Coyle's first touch. Peter Godfrey leaning in above Alan Lawrence to nod that out for the throw. Yes, Hardy finding space. Challenged by Godfrey. Yes, Coyle. The interception made by Whitaker. Headed away by McWilliams. Back marking Andy Smith. Balfour couldn't find a way past McWilliams. Here's Balfour again. This is Sammy Cohn playing in midfield despite wearing number five. McPhee picking out Lawrence. This is good play from Airdrie. They're showing a lot of patience. Coyle has his kipper. McPhee supporting. Here's Coyle again. No room for the cross. Owen Coyle starting the match wide on the left side of the Airdrie midfield. Airdrie with the benefit of the breeze in the first half. Falkirk not finding it easy to get a hold of the ball in the middle of the field at this stage. There's McWilliams. There's Stainrod. McGibbon on the left. Taking on Stewart. Watson's clearance. Warren supported by the former Falkirk player, Sammy Kahn. This is Smith. Taking out Harvey through the gap. Balfour looking for Coyle. That's good play again from Airdrie. Uh, very determined tackling there by Smith. It's kept in play by McPhee. Smith once again. Sandy Stewart makes space for himself. Well, certainly not what Paul Jack intended. Offering a quick apology there to Alan Lawrence, who was the target for the pass. Very healthy attendance here at Brumfield. Five or six thousand expected from Falkirk. There's no outside as May breaks on the right, followed all the way back by Coyle. Former Hibbs and Brentford player. Representing another investment by Falkirk in their future. Well, the tackling was tough enough. In the end, there's a free kick to Falkirk. Owen Coyle back there with that tough tackle on May. So, free kick to Falkirk. There's a great header, and it's been given again. The perfect start for Falkirk. The header from Sam McGibbon in the 10th minute of the match. Well, the orthodox free kick, McGibbon getting up so well to rifle the header past John Martin. Oh, what a superb goal it was from McGibbon. And I make that his seventh goal before cameras this season. The free kick came from Alec Taylor. Whistling across the face of the goal, and McGibbon timed it brilliantly to bullet home the header. Well, these Falkirk fans savouring the moment as McGibbon puts them ahead. And Airdrie, who had something of a brittle defence early in the season, have done much better in that aspect of the play in recent weeks. Graham Harvey with a shot. Well, fine retaliation there from Harvey. Trying to find space for this right foot shot. It was dipping all right, and Marshall was relieved to see that go over. So 
So the entry bench without, of course, Jimmy Bowen, who was banished to the stand by the SFA in midweek. Stuart lending a hand there for Smith. Neil Duffy showing his versatility, operating right in the heart of midfield for Falkirk. Strong man in that area. Intended to win the ball for the more skillful player around him. Here's Sam McGibbon with an excellent chance for the second, going all the way himself. And a good save by John Martin. Well, the referee doesn't see it that way. He's given a goal kick, but there's no question in my mind that Martin made a good block. Well, there was McGibbon through on his own, setting himself for the shot. Martin going down, clearly parrying the ball for a corner. But the referee on the blind side didn't see that. play but only for the benefit of Evan Balfour there's McPhee now Harvey good play there by Whitaker there's no outside this time but Steinrod didn't quite have the pace well had the clock been turned back a few years Simon Steinrod may have made that now 32 years old very experienced striker Steinrod's header there's Taylor Decision goes Airdrie's way. Duffy was the culprit. Good play by Stewart. This is Con. Now Lawrence. Good play by Lawrence. Well, he knew exactly what he was going to do when that pass reached him. Not quite enough power in the final shot, but look at the chest control here going inside Whitaker for that left foot shot, which Marshall did well to cover. Harvey holding off Godfrey that time, looking for Sandy Stewart, but McWilliam steps in. Supported inside by Steinrod, needing all his pace to get away from Jack. Well, a clumsy late challenge by Paul Jack, and it's one which I think will earn him a yellow card. Derek McWilliams, his credit, pleading the case of Paul Jack, suggesting to the referee that a free kick is adequate, but there will be a booking. Well, it was fine play by Derek McWilliams, which forced that clumsy challenge by Jack. So Alec Taylor will take this free kick, his last one, and Paul Kirk the lead. Well, it was intended for Steinrod. An easy one in the end for Martin. For Steinrod. Chesting it down for Taylor. By McWilliams. There's no question at all that that early goal has settled Falkirk. Here's McGibbon. And McQueen. Good possession play from Falkirk. That's Alec Taylor setting it up for McGibbon. such an impact for Falkirk since he arrived from Brentford that's his fourth goal for the club and it puts Falkirk two ahead as well one inside the box by Whittaker the first time and it's helped off from Duffy the second time and Airdrie have a corner kick Neil Duffy took a knock in the face there as he cleared that that's why Brian Whittaker is signalling for attention former Dundee United youngster well a cut eye there for Neil Duffy he almost certainly have to leave the field for repairs well that decision has been taken instantly there could be no doubt about that It'll have to be patched up if he's to continue 
football cup continuing for the moment with 10 men. For a kick from Coyle, easily taken by Gordon Marshall. No one making any challenge. So Neil Duffy going perhaps for a stitch or two in that left eye. Breaks off Stainrod, who took a knock there, colliding with Watson. There's Jack. Harvey's header finds Conn supporting well from midfield. There's an error by Smith. Harvey must score now. And the arrival of Peter Godfrey denies Airdrie. What would have been a vital goal. And what a relief for Gary Smith. It was his error from the pass back. He didn't spot Graham Harvey made that an easy one it would appear for Harvey but Gordon Marshall did well going down at his feet and Harvey was then crowded out in the end the best chance for Avery so far undoubtedly falling to Graham Harvey so back comes Neil Duffy that left eye blast up to let him resume his role in midfield there's Coyle Tommy Conn collects. McPhee supporting. He has Smith ahead of him. He's looking to send over the cross. Here's Owen Coyle. A ricochet off the head of Derek McWilliams. The result of the corner kick to Airdrie. Well, the most potent threat may well be John Watson right on the goal line for Airdrie. Getting in by Coyle. Andy Smith get up well sorted, Balfour and Watson turned it over. Just trying to flick that into the top corner with the glancing header. Well, the Falcon defence clearly in trouble here. Header down was by Andy Smith and then Watson sent it over. Scored a, an awful lot of goals for Dunfermline in his time there. McWilliams with a touch on, there's Paul Jack. And referee John Smith brings a thoroughly entertaining first half to an end. It started so brightly for Airdrie until Sam McGivern took a hand once again, rifling home a header from an Alec Taylor free kick in 10 minutes. And then Eddie May cashed in on the best attacking move of the match for Falkirk by turning in McGivern's cross to make the half-time score at Broomfield. Airdrie nil, Falkirk 2. So Airdrie get off to a start in a second half, which may turn out to be as crucial a 45-minute period as they've faced all season. Trailing Falkirk before this match by three points, although they've got a game less. They really cannot afford to lose this afternoon. And that will have been impressed upon them, I'm not out, by Jimmy Bone during that half-time interval. The Falkirk, the priority at the start of this second half, will undoubtedly be to make certain they give nothing away in the opening 10 to 15 minutes. Is Ian McPhee, the early captain with the free kick. John Watson is going forward. Beaten to that by Godfrey. Some appeals for a foul or a penalty kick, in fact, inside the area. But waved aside by referee Smith. So the sun could be awkward for John Martin in the early goal. Here's Alan Lawrence. He's turned back by Godfrey. He settled very quickly into that pocket defence. Beyond the McPhee and Stainrod, here's a chance for Eddie May to set something up. And Andy Smith back defending, doing well, playing that against Sam McGiven for the Airdrie throw. But an awkward moment again, briefly, for the Airdrie defence. Worked on by Balfour in midfield, Coyle battling hard for possession against McWilliams. Bit of jersey pulling there by McWilliams, it's a free kick to Airdrie. Williams concentrating on defence at this stage of the match for Falkirk. There's Paul Jack. Lawrence helps it on. There's Smith going in. He's off the ball by Eddie May. Well, the referee waves play on, but there appeared to be a clear push there by May on Andy Smith. And relief there without question for the Falkirk defence. 
As McGibbon breaks now for Falkirk at the other end. Here's McWilliams. Not quite what he intended, slicing that across. Taylor trying to retrieve it, couldn't quite make it. Well, this certainly was a controversial moment as that ball was played forward here to Alan Lawrence. His little head flick was on there, looking for Andy Smith on the run. And from this position, it appeared clear that Eddie May eased him right off the ball. Jack's header goes straight to McWilliams. Stopped there by Stewart. There's McQueen. Staying runs dummy. Now just too much pace on the ball. Otherwise, May would have been in the clear. The inside. Here's Paul Jack. Coyle using Sandy Stewart. Adrian contemplating changes. Activity on the bench. Here's Taylor. Always manages to make space for himself. Another good ball. Trying to release thin run on the right. Gary Smith is behind him. Get in shot for McGibbon. Completely missed by Paul Jack. The ball bubbled over his foot just as he went to play the ball. And Sam McGibbon had a great chance, which he couldn't react to. Missed by Jack and trundled wide by McGibbon. The referee has now spotted the presence of Danny Traney on the touchline. He is going to replace Andy Smith. We have to gamble now. They have to get attacking players on the field. Look for a moment as though they may put on both substitutes, but they've contented themselves with just Craney for the moment. Balfour doing well in the air. Here's Harvey. Back to Craney. Godfrey doing well again in the heart of the defence. And Stainrod leading into McPhee. He can see another free kick. Well, they have to hand it to Adrian. They haven't given up the fight at any stage so far. Here's Harvey. Tackled inside the area by Gary Smith, and the referee Smith has given a penalty kick. This could be the lifeline for Airdrie. Well, another moment of controversy as this ball is played forward by Sammy Khan. Here's Graham Harvey, he appears to be being held there by Gary Smith. When the tackle came in, he certainly played the ball. It must have been for the earlier holding, not for the final tackle. So here's Owen Coyle with a vital penalty kick for Airdrie. This could set us up for a tremendous finish to the match. It's Coyle against Gordon Marshall. Owen Coyle looking for his 19th goal of the season. And he's missed it. An easy save in the end for Gordon Marshall. And that may well turn out to be the last chance for Airdrie in this match. It may also signal the end of their promotion hopes. A poorly struck penalty by Coyle. No problem for Gordon Marshall. Well, what a dramatic moment. It's a great break that for Falkirk. Going Coyle could hardly miss in the early part of the season. He's found life much more difficult in the goal scoring sense since his return after that serious knee injury. Here's Lawrence though, breaking in the right, a chance on again for Airdrie, looking up for support in the middle, and playing the ball into the side netting, things not going Airdrie's way in front of goal. And off the head of Paul Jack, there's Conn running behind him. Very sure-footed with that pass back. And Airdrie have altered their formation now as they throw everything into attack. They have pushed John Watson to a striking role. But here's Stainrod breaking for Falkirk. This could tie it up. Perfectly finished by Stainrod. That surely ties up the points for Falkirk. Well, what deadly finishing this was by the Falkirk captain. A long clearance catching out the other defence. He took that on the drop, drilled the ball beyond John Martin to 
the foot, Falkirk, three in front. Well, what a great piece of finishing by Simon Stainrod. This is his 15th goal of the season. One long ball catching out the other defence. He looked up to himself with a right foot shot, and Martin was left helpless. Long ball from McPhee. Headed on there by Watson for Harvey. He's bundled down there. That challenge from the rear by Whittaker, but the referee's done nothing wrong with that. So another fleeting chance goes a begging for Airdrie. And there's going to be an alteration made by Falkirk. Making a substitution. The player going off to tremendous applause is the scorer of the opening goal, Sam McGiven. There's the applause for McGiven from the Falkirk supporters. And the player coming on is Peter Heddleston. Back with Paul Jack Gadry ending the game as they started it on the attack. But in the middle of the match, they lost three goals. And that's why they'll end this match. Nothing to show for their efforts. Well, Falkirk will march on at the top. Here's Heatherston. Stainrod playing it through the gap. And McWilliams, this could be the fourth. The other defence wide open. There's McWilliams. And a superb save from John Martin. Well, a fourth for Falkirk. Really would have put a complexion on the affair, which would not be justified. So the ball played into this space. The Airdrie defence had all pushed up supporting an attack. There was Derek McWilliams, but it was a great block by Martin. Corner oh, kick taken short. Heatherston and Duffy together. It's Duffy again. The offside flag is up. Almost inevitable that would be a free kick. So Falkert not only snatching two points, but also enhancing their goal difference as the final whistle goes the happiest of afternoons for Falkirk they've turned out to be convincing winners in the end despite great efforts made by Andrew. these Falkirk supporters traveling the country now consistently to support Falkirk's charge toward the Premier Division Simon Steinrod the skipper led the line well scored the crucial third which tied up the game but Andrew will be looking back on that missed penalty kick from Owen Coyle just one minute before Simon Stainrod tied the match up for Falkirk. So the applause ring around Broomfield from these Falkirk supporters who march on towards promotion. The final score at Broomfield, every nil, Falkirk three. Jim, another convincing victory here at Broomfield, obviously a happy hunting ground. Did that game go according to plan? Yes, uh, we felt that Airdrie would uh, obviously cup tie it early doors and, and play the long ball and try and catch us out of the back. We, we actually felt that uh, that was one of their weak spots and for the first, you know, 25 minutes we continued to knock the ball into space and get behind them and we caused them havoc and uh, we did the damage but overall I felt Falkirk were the, were the better side uh, right throughout the 90 minutes. People have been saying in some places that you're better going forward than you are at the back but your defence seemed to play a key role this afternoon. How do you react to any criticism of your defence? Well, I can understand it really. I think they should look after their own defences uh, because Falkirk have lost the least goal goals this season and uh, so that proves that the defence is doing their jobs. Yes, we like to go forward and we like to attack and we've scored the goals uh, to prove that, but we've also, we can do our job there. And uh, really, you know, the people that are saying that, uh, I don't know, I can't understand it because the proof's in the pudding and we, you know, you need to check the facts. And we, you know, we've had another clean sheet here today, uh, scored another three goals and... Uh, you know, just let them keep knocking us and we'll just keep bouncing back. Well, despite the fact that it was played in cup tie spirit, your second goal, I think, must have given you particular pleasure, didn't it? Well, we scored three cracking goals here on our last visit, uh, Simon McGiven, which uh, we know about. And I think the second goal equaled that, actually. It was a, a great passing movement. And then we got behind him and Sammy looked as if he was going to shoot. And he got a great ball across the face of goals and Eddie's cheek as you like uh, popped up in the right spot as he's done since we bought him. He's you know he's proven to be a tremendous asset and uh, he's always in the uh, in, in there capable of scoring a goal and uh, it was a great move and it just set us up nicely. And then obviously Gordon Marshall's penalty save is uh, you know could have let them back in the game. But I felt that was a hard uh, decision and uh, or a harsh decision and, and it got his just rewards. But then Simon scored a tremendous goal and, and uh, took the pressure off us again and we could have won him the 4-5 at the end of the, end of the day, but 
we're happy and, and we're right on track for the Premier League. What's the secret of the Falcons' success, do you think? Uh, teamwork. We all work hard in training. We're all behind the manager and uh, a preparedness to, to get down to the, to the real graft and, and stick in together. And that's seen us through so far. Did you approach this game as one of the major hurdles before the end of the season? <laughs> we approached it exactly the same as we've approached all the games. And uh, that's with a, you know, a good professional attitude. And it, it's seen us through so far. And there's no need, need to change it just for one game. I noticed in the game, despite the importance of the occasion, you were still willing to offer one or two little tricks and circus acts which seem to upset the management team. Is that a part of your play? Well, I've heard these circus acts, but I, I define them as high-skilled football class sort of skills. But, uh, you know, you define them however you will. From the point of view of skippering the Falkirk side, do you think it's something which helps the rest of your teammates in tight positions? Uh, I think so, yeah. Uh, I mean, generally, the skippers come in the back four position or the centre of midfield, but uh, uh, having played in a couple of countries, England and France, and, and played at the highest level, I think it's been a good move for the manager to, to, to make me captain, and it's, uh, I think it's, it, it's rubbed off on the other players, and, and we've all done well through, the, through this period of the season. There's a fair mixture of uh, experience and youth in the side. How good do you think this Falkirk side is, comparing them with teams you've played in at the top level before? Uh, well, there's a way to go, yeah. I mean, we, we, we're a good side, but... We're, we're really just building, you know. We've got to build, and, and if uh, if luck uh, carries through and we and we do go up, then we shall have to obviously add to the squad because we need a much bigger squad to compete in the Premier League, and uh, I'm sure that'll be a priority. Will you be there for the Premier League? Uh, hopefully, yes. Yes. Great. Well done. Thanks. Thank you. Shy retiring Simon <laughs> Steenrod, and again some great entertainment there from the Scottish First Division. Derek, yeah, marvellous. Mighty impressive Falkirk, and looking now surefire certs for Premier Football next season. Well, I didn't fancy them to be honest with you, Rob. I always fancied Dundee and Airdrie to go, but on that performance today, yet again, Falkirk looking great. You know, the great thing about the First Division is they don't defend at all. They'll go out there and enjoy themselves. I mean, there's so many chances created in that game today, it wasn't true. That's right, you talk about chances, we'll see the three goals in a minute. But let's look at some of the incidents which could have led to goals as well. Yeah. And right at the start, Sammy McGovern. Well, great chance, isn't it? He's been played on there, I think it's John Watson in the middle there. And uh, his first touch was marvellous, but it's just, well, look, just bobbled a little bit for him. And uh, well done to the early defenders there for uh, just knocking him off balance. But well, look, young Smith there. This was at 2-0 to uh, Robin. Great chance here for Airdrie to get back yeah. into the game. Good goalkeeping again, but as a striker, you've got to try and hit the target there for a goal. John Watson, a bit lucky here. He's only a yard out and just tried to flick the ball off his head, but God Marshall was, was certainly straight behind it. What about this for a bobble? This is the time when you look at the boots and say, what happened here? <laughs> and it, you're looking everywhere by yourself. That was just a, an odd bobble there. But uh, no doubt Owen, who scored 18 goals this season, will be disappointed with that. I mean, God actually had to come back to get that ball. It wasn't well struck at all. He'll be disappointed. This is the one that uh, strikers love. I'm surprised that Derek just, just lob him. Look, just there. What a lob over the goalkeeper. Ah, it's but, easy uh, for you, though, isn't it? No, I've done it on one occasion, I think. <laughs> Here are the goals now, the three goals. Yeah. Well, this is a great goal as far as Sammy McGivern's concerned. But what about the Airdrie defence? You know, you've got three six footers there. Sammy's only about 5'8, five, 5'9, five, able to out jump them and score. This is a cracking goal. The referee does well. Could have given a foul there, but didn't. Uh, McGivern looks up, squares it. Whoa, cheeky Eddie goal. May. Different class. Great strike. And of course, a third one, bad for defenders to lose it from a goalkeeper's kicks. Uh, a bad defensive mistake, but uh, what about the finish from Simon Stainrod? Great finish. Is that the end, do you think, of Airdrie's promotion hopes? No, I don't think so. I think uh, it's now down to there's six teams. You, know, you look at Kilmarnock there, isn't it, as well? Partick Thistle have come into it. I mean, this is a tremendous league, this first division. I think it could go all the way to the last game. That's right, and Dundee struggling as well. I mean, they needed a late equaliser from Keith Wright to get a point at Clyde Bank. Today. Well, they'd lost two games at Fair Hill in, in five days, beaten by Clyde and Thistle. So it was good for them to get a point today away from home, bro. Derek, thanks very much. So Falkirk looking then hot favourites for the First Division Championship, although that could be famous last words with the lead having been changing on almost a weekly basis. Keith Wright, as I said, struck a late equaliser at Clyde Bank for Dundee, who've got one win to show from their last five games. Thistle, Kilmarnock and Hamilton, all fringe contenders for the step up. Clyde lost at Brecon and went back to the bottom. Division 2, Stirling Albion have the champagne still on ice. They lost at home to Alloa when a win would have clinched promotion. Their lead's now cut to a mere nine points with six games to go. Eight clubs are in contention 
for the second route to first division football. So a lot of excitement still to come in division two into rugby now. And they won't need to be told how to celebrate at Boroughmuir Rugby Club tonight because the Edinburgh team beat relegated Edinburgh Wanderers at Megatland 34-14 to clinch their first McEwen's National League Championship. Heriots hoping they'd fall at the last hurdle beat Kelso 26-14. At the bottom, Stuart's Melville, down and out a fortnight ago, continued their fight back with the defeat of Curry, the second relegation spot still to be settled. West of Scotland sealed their promotion from the second division with the 53-6 demolition of Langham. Watsonians were already up as champions. Stand by now for some top amateur boxing. The Scottish ABA finals in Grangemouth offer not only the chance to become the nation's number one, but also the honour of boxing for Scotland in the forthcoming British and European championships. Here's the pick of the action at ringside, Jim Neely. So it's Mooney in the white vest and the claret trunks. And in the green and gold of the Croy Miners, Paul Weir, the defending champion. Mallow took the title also in 1989, but that was on a walkover, not another light flyweight wanted to enter. Some nice switch hitting from Weir in the first round. Mooney with perhaps a little of an advantage in terms of reach. Flecks of blood around the nose of Paul Weir at the moment. Big crisp punch to the torso by Mooney, and that counts. As Weir trying that again, the feint with the right. Quite impressed by Alan Mooney, and he's drawn some blood from the nose of the defending champion. A good stiff left. We are very much the favourite, but is not getting things all his own way, especially in the second round. to go to the end of the second and uh, quite a lot of blood now coming from the nose of Paul Weir. Well they started off at a really cracking pace and maybe a, a little bit of zip got out of both of them. Neither had to box to reach this final. Mooney coping pretty well with the two fisted attacks from Paul Weir. Again, a nice variation from Mooney coming with the uppercut. This has been a great scrap. Well, there's the youngster, Alan Mooney, just a For sale, weekend home with views across the South Downs and the Yorkshire Dales. Excellent sailing and golf. Hot running water, cold running water. Good fishing, home cooking. Friendly neighbours, large back garden. When you own a caravan, great weekends and holidays are round the corner. Just get up and go. For a free guide, ask your dealer. Look carefully at these two cars. The blue one is fitted with a new set of Monroe shock absorbers. The red one isn't. Its shocks are worn out. And its wheels leave the ground every time it meets a bump. Steering becomes more and more difficult. This car's out of control. But with Monroe shock absorbers, the blue car stays firmly on the ground. So the ride's a lot more comfortable and a good deal safer. Monroe shock absorbers, a firm grip on the road.
They were in a land that time had forgotten, and what they saw, they would remember for the rest of their lives. The Australian Tourist Commission, in association with Qantas Airways, present Australia. It has to be seen to be believed. For a free brochure, call us now. To help us plan for tomorrow, please fill in your census form today. The census. It counts because you count. British troops are back in the Gulf, and John Major's plan for a safe haven for the Kurds is top of the political agenda. But what are the implications for the peace process in the world's most volatile area? Scottish International looks at the problem Sunday at 6 on Scottish. And now on Scottish, we have the top sporting action, including highlights from Fur Hill and the Rumbelows Cup final at Wembley. In Scott Sport, with Jim White and the team. afternoon. Both Rangers and Aberdeen showed the tough side to their character this weekend, winning crucial matches as the race for the Premier League title goes on. They know dropped points now could cost them dear. We concentrate on the fascinating battle for promotion in the first division and leaders Falkirk are stretched all the way against Partick Thistle. In Spain, Barcelona look more and more like league champions. Another convincing win for them this weekend. And the Rumbelows Cup final at Wembley this afternoon at Sheffield Wednesday against Manchester United. But first, former Rangers manager Graham Souness has not heard the last from the Scottish Football Association. While his touchline ban has not been extended to England, we can reveal that the SFA still intend to discuss recent comments made by him about referees. And should they decide to take action, they will do so through the FA in England. Now then, Firhill claimed centre stage yesterday in the fascinating fight for promotion from the First Division. Partick Thistle, who sit on the fringe of the promotion race, face leaders Falkirk, who are odds-on to go up. Commentator, Jerry McNee. There's John Lemby's Partick Thistle line-up, which knows it's in a win or bust situation for promotion. Thistle know a draw is no good to them, but confidence should be high as they've won the two previous league games against Falkirk this season. And few know Falkirk better than Jim Duffy, who played for them and managed them before moving on to help restore Thistle's fortunes. He's been an influential figure in defence and contributed three goals, all from the penalty spot. And no Firhill occasion is complete without the hugely popular figure of Chick Charlie, whose former clubs include Pollock Juniors, St Byron, Ayr, Clydebank and Hamilton. He scored eight goals this season. Falkirk are without Derek McWilliams who's suspended, but manager Jim Jeffries has built a solid and harmonious squad which knows it's now within touching distance of the big time. And one player instrumental in their fine run has been 28-year-old Alex Taylor, a real bargain from Walsall this season at £40,000. He hasn't missed a game since arriving in October and is very much the playmaker of the side. And there's no doubt about the real character of the team, and that's Simon Stainrod. He was signed for £100,000 from French club Rouen, and Falkirk are, in fact, his eighth senior club. He scored 15 goals this season. The referee is Mr Brian McGinley from Balfron. And so Patrick Thistle get the sixth beating of the clubs this season underway. Thistle have won three, drawn one, and lost one. Very tight games in the cup competitions as well between the sides. But an early knock there for Simon Stainrod as he was challenged by Graham Robertson. So a free kick to Falkirk. Whitaker's free kick. By Duffy. Elliot down the line for Buckley. Good 
mopping up there by Tommy McQueen. Good challenge by Jim Duffy, and of course, uh, former Falkirk player and manager. Picked up by Sammy Johnson, forward now to Buckley. Well, Thistle showing their early intentions. Good cross coming into the middle. Appreciated by the big crowd. Ahead are just over the bar. Sammy Johnson there, involved in the action. And again, getting the touch foul for Thistle. Charnley racing forward. John Hughes for Falkirk. Gets some backing from Gary Smith. Cut out by Paul McLaughlin for Thistle. Johnson into the path of Robertson. Patrick Thistle's throw. What about effort again by Sammy Johnson? Thistle certainly carrying the game forward at every opportunity up there by Buckley and the first time shot it's Gary Smith well out of play Buckley for Thistle winning the free kick referee indicating an elbow use by Gary Smith Thistle pushing everyone forward. Lachlan shot, coming off Taylor. Cut out by Peter Godfrey. Some determined play by Thistle. Godfrey to Falkirk Rescue. Awkward cross coming in. The header dipping over. Gary Peebles getting the touch. Charlie on the left. The header over the bar. Tommy McQueen trying to find McGivern. A chance at it. Stain Rod to Hughes. Free kick against Charlie. to take the free kick for Falkirk. Stainrod getting a nice little touch. A complete miss kick by Stainrod, but still Falkirk have it. Eddie May, they'll pick it forward, the header, the flag's up though, against McGivern. The linesman's flag raised before he made contact with the ball. Well, it was driven right across goal, it was Eddie May after Stainrod's miss who delivered the cross 
and McGivern rising high above the defenders, but no luck on this occasion. The flag up on the far side. Lashen battling hard for Thistle. Elliot cut out by Godfrey. Ball driven forward, oh, a great save by Gordon Marshall. Well, the ball taking a deflection as the shot came in. The goalkeeper changing direction, did well. The other one being watched by Ray, supported by McQueen. Awkward one for Duffy. Well, Alec Taylor almost cashing in. Lashen switching the play. Picked up now by David Elliott. Good play by Elliott, losing the fullback. The shot on. It was blocked by Brian Whitaker. The shot from Sammy Johnson. That was a good build up by Thistle. David Elliott involved on the left. Teeing it up for Sammy Johnson. So that certainly got the Thistle fans roaring. Play by Elliot. The shot on, oh, oh, tremendous goal by Colin McLashan. Well, what a tremendous shot. It was great play by Elliot, tenacious play by Elliot. The ball sent into the middle. It came off Elliot's head again. Look at that shot, right into the corner of the net. So Colin McLashan's 11th goal of the season with 20 minutes gone and Patrick Thistle leading by one goal to nil. Taylor for Falker. Nice little dummy by Stainrod. The ball for the defence. No chances taken by Graham Robertson. Under pressure from Eddie May, and he headed behind for the corner. Then Godfrey coming forward to the area. Play to the near post. The shot out from Taylor, and well taken by Andy Mudder. Well, he couldn't have had much of a view of that ball as it broke out to Alec Taylor. McGovern, in fact, knocked it back into. His path, the first time shot coming through a ruck of players, well taken by Andy Murder. Just a bit unlucky. Stainrod winning the throw in for Falcon. Touch on by Eddie May. Oh, and the ball just inches past the post. Well, Thistle living dangerously. It was May who got his head to the ball and almost taking a ricochet off Stainrod into the net. Just inches away. Still Hughes. Stainrod, flipping it forward, it was good defending by Graham Robertson as he put the ball behind for the corner, well lovely play by Stainrod, flipping the ball with his right foot, Robertson under a lot of pressure. Stainrod's corner and there goes the half time whistle. 
Well, a superb goal from Colin McGlashan after 20 minutes. There was some great play by Elliot leading up to it, and McGlashan sending a powerful shot right into the corner of the net. The halftime score here at Fir Hill, Partick Thistle 1, Falkirk 0. Well, baby, I'm thinking about your chocolate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, baby, I'm thinking about your taste. Mm -hmm. Well, baby, I'm thinking about your chocolate. Thinking about your taste. Mm -hmm. Smith's menswear, quality, style and service in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Ça vient fait de m'appeler. C'est super ici. Garçon de boisson fraîche s'il vous plaît. T'obtiens toujours ce que tu veux. C'est génial. <laughs> if you're hiring a car, there's only one place to look. If you're hiring a van, there's only one place to look. The new Esso Collection catalogue is out now with more choice, more quality gifts. View it at a forecourt near you. Sie mir bitte den Weg zu der Brauerei zeigen. Wo ist die Brauerei? Entschuldigung. I've been trying to learn German. I got one of these uh, cassettes that teaches you while you're asleep. I don't know, I don't know. I, I still can't speak the language, but I do dream with uncompromising efficiency. And I've been practicing uh, drinking my Holston pills like the Germans, too. They drink it cold. Well, <laughs> they're not an emotional race. Not a flicker. Second half underway. A quick check on both sides shows no substitutions. This will have Bobby Law and Paul McGovern on the bench. Paul Cook have Neil Duffy, son of a famous Patrick Thistle player, of course, and Crawford Bapti on the bench. Well, Falk pushing forward, early doors. Trying to get themselves back into this game. It all fell a bit flat after McClashen put Thistle ahead. Steve Rod just failing to keep the ball in play, so the goal kick to Thistle. through to McGivern, the ball right across the face of goal, but the flag had gone up against the Falkirk striker, that was excellent play by Eddie May, McGivern no, just offside, Frank Butler getting a, a touch to the ball, Johnson to Charnley, Again. That was cut out by Eddie May back helping in defence. This will have the corner, that's a signal for Ray to move forward, Gordon Ray. on the back post. Charnley. The chance on. It's blocked. Well, 
ball right across the face of goal by David Elliott. Well, Falkirk living dangerously as Charnley sent the ball over. There was Johnson with the first effort. And then Elliott right across the face of goal. Just uh, too much pace in it for McGlashan to get a put in. And McGivern making a late challenge on the goalkeeper. Well, Falkirk felt they should have had the corner kick. And McGivern being called over by the referee. Falkirk players, Hitherson claiming a corner. Not enough luck in that challenge, but enough to have the player called over by the referee. So McGivern showing the yellow card. Taylor supported by Smith. Stain Rod moving it to Hughes. Heatherston is possessed by Charlie. Four against three here. Forward for Elliott to chase, taking on Whitaker. Well handled by Gordon Marshall. Good break forward though by Patrick Thistle. Having the numerical advantage, Charlie did well. Push the ball forward to Elliott. Whitaker coming across. A good confident catch by the goalkeeper. Johnson, chased by Eddie May, nice change of pace by Johnson, and some dithering in defence, Elliott gets away from Smith, Charlie, and that one had got Marshall stretching, again it was good play by Elliott, Charlie taking it first time, Powerful run, switching it to McGivern. Taylor, Ellie Smith, cross with the right foot, the goalkeeper committing himself, good handling by Andy Murdoch, and that earns the goalkeeper applause from the Thistle fans. Well, the early ball coming in from Gary Smith, plenty of players in attendance, good handling by the keeper. substitution and it's Duffy coming on for Smith well penalty kick awarded well that looked a very soft award as Stainrod went down the referee though pointing straight to the spot the free kick coming forward McLaughlin missing out on it Stainrod moving in, challenged by Ray, the referee immediately pointing to the spot. So it will be Tommy McQueen to take the kick, playing his 30th consecutive game this afternoon comes forward and he scored great penalty right into the corner so Falkirk get themselves back into the game well struck penalty right in at the post giving Murdoch no chance so 78 minutes gone Stick there, Stainrod coming through. Well, what a chance to put Falkirk into the lead. 
dithering in the middle of the field by Thistle. A chance for Simon Steenrod to get his 16th goal of the season. Godfrey. Sending the ball out of play for the throw in to Thistle. On perhaps for Elliot, headed away by Duffy. Charlie. The official players claiming there was a hand used by a pocket defender, but the referee waving away the claims. Duffy clearing. It's Charlie threatening. Another claiming. The ball come off the hand of the arm of a pocket defender, but Ryan McGinley, the referee, well up with the plate. A little chance, perhaps, for Thistle. Godfrey sticking well to the task, chasing in after McGovern. Heatherston for Falcon. McGovern. Referee checking his watch. And there goes the final whistle. So a fine result for Falkirk. They had gone behind in the 20th minute to a great goal by Colin McLashan, but fighting back after 78 minutes after Stainrod was fouled in the box by Ray, and there was Tommy McQueen to step up and make an excellent job of the spot kick. The final score here at Firhill, Partick Thistle 1, Falkirk 1. John is at the end of Thistle's challenge for the Premier League this season. Yes, I would say so, although we'll, we'll keep fighting, really, Jerry, until it's mathematically impossible, but I would say it's very, very slim now. In fact, it's a million to one, really. And yet, in the first half, a smashing goal by Colin McGlash, and it looked good for you at that point. Yes, because we were playing, we are playing good football, getting to the byline, getting it across, and causing all sorts of trouble. We had a great chance just to back it, and we, we didn't even button it up then, but uh, in saying that, that's football, and we've just got to take it as it comes. So what happened in the second half? You just went flat. I was very disappointed with the players in the second half because we stopped passing the ball. I think they thought they had the game won, uh, won nothing and just defended instead of going forward and looking for another goal because looking at the first half, we, could, we were penetrating them, you know, we were getting behind them and, and we stopped doing that, stopped creating the chances. Now you've played all of the other challengers, uh, you will battle on, but who do you fancy to go up now? Well, I, I really find, I'll stay by what I said early in the, early in the season. If we, if we weren't there, I would say that Falkers are certain now. I'd go as far as to say that. And I think Dundee might do it, although they've got a more difficult run in than Airdrie, but I think Dundee just might do it. And we're going to have a new pitch here, hopefully, for next season. Yes, and under Sal Heaton, Jerry, I hope. And uh, I would say that's been the big problem here. Uh, we're a now-now football side, and the pitch it hasn't helped, but it's the same for both teams. You've just got to go out and carry on with it. Simon, three games left and two of them at home. You must be feeling reasonably confident. We're confident, but not complacent. Uh, you know, as you say, three games left. Uh, the, the sides we're going to play against are going to be fired up to try and get a point or two off us. And uh, we're going to be fighting all the way until the last ball's kicked. This was always going to be a difficult one for you today, though. It proved very difficult as well. You know, They, they really did battle. Uh, in the first 20 minutes, I was getting kicked all over the place. And uh, it was uh, very interesting indeed. You've played in a few places in your career. I think this is your eighth club. Is the first division proving as tough as anywhere you've been before? Well, it's tough at the top, I think, uh, because there's so much competition between ourselves, Dundee and Airdrie. You know, there's a lot of pressure, and we're very determined to succeed, and so I think that filters through to the players. But, uh, you know, it's the situation that makes it tough, really, not, not the actual games. So, morale in the dressing room. I watched you all training the other day. It seemed to be a very harmonious squad. Is that the kind of thing that's going to carry you through? Uh, we hope so. Uh, you say there's three games to go. We are a harmonious squad. Uh, we enjoy working with each other, and uh, I think we'll continue till, till, till the last day. Gordon, when Colin McGlashan scored that very good goal, I thought we expected the, the game to burst to life, but the very opposite happened. Yeah, it wasn't a good game of football. Um, probably the result was a bit right. Falk had come back into the game in the second half. But I think when we arrived at Firhill yesterday and had, had a look at the pitch, I mean, it's impossible to play good football on a surface like that. And I think, um, obviously, with Clyde sharing the ground, makes it very, very difficult. And it must be frustrating for John Lambie, because he's got a lot of players, as he said, that like to knock the ball around, and that's very difficult in those circumstances. It was great to see Jim Duffy again yesterday. His career was over after injury against Rangers. He went into management. He's come back again. What a great example to younger defenders. 
Yeah, well, I worked, I worked with Jim at Airdrie for some time, and uh, as well as being a, a terrific coach, he's a great organiser as well. Organised his back four well yesterday. Cool head as well. And I'd have loved to have seen Jim Duffy playing in the Premier League next year, but I don't think we're going to see that. We always cringe a bit when Jim's going into tackles like that. After the knee injury, this is great defending here. Stands his ground against Simon Stainwood and just whips the ball away. Well, talking of Simon, he's possibly played better games than yesterday, but uh, really a very gifted player and entertainer. Yeah, um, he's, I mean, it cost Falkirk a lot of money bringing him back, back from French football, but it's been money well spent. And they're playing against Jim Duffy and Gordon Ray yesterday. You're, you're liable to get a few bruises when you play against these two. A little bit soft the penalty. You're liable to get a few bruises, but... I mean, he's a tough customer, and that's speaking from experience, because I've had one or two run-ins with Simon Stainrod myself. Ball bobbles up a bit here, surface again, but that could have been it, 2-1. Well, there is, I'm told, a wee bit of a problem with his contract that has to be tightened up at uh, the end of the season. It would be good to see, you're talking about Jim Duffy in the Premier League. I think uh, Stainrod would look good in the Premier Division. Certainly, he's got the ability to play in the, the Premier League. He's more than capable of scoring the goals that he's scoring in the First Division at the higher level, as he's proved in the past with the clubs that he's played for. Now, when you're talking of entertainers, Chick Charnley is always at the, the top of the list, and uh, really a terrific game by him yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, he just very rarely gives the ball away. I mean, his passing's first class, and... It's, it's, when, when, you think of the, when you think of a surface like that, a ball bobbling about all over the place. It's good entertainment, Chick Chandler, very popular with the, with the Jags fans. And I think it's important for Partick Thistle. I mean, there's been a lot of, I mean, there's a great goal there by Colin McGlash, and there's been a lot of interest from English clubs in Chick Chandler. But if they can manage to hold on to him, I think next season Partick Thistle will start favourites for the first division. I, I like the way, for instance, uh, he's the confidence to take players on. He's always, always backing up as well. Yeah, I mean, he works hard as well. I mean, one of the things I think we've said about Chick Charlie in the past is his temperament might have let him down once or twice, but there were certainly no signs of that yesterday. And you see here, he gets past good, good dribbling skills, he gets past players at ease. Plays it nice and simple. But he can, he can, with a lovely left foot, lovely switch of play here over to um, Graham Robertson. Now, the penalty was a vital moment. It could have cost this all their last chance of going up. It could mean Falkirk being champions. I'm still not convinced about it. Well, uh, neither am I, once, and I've seen it once or twice. I think Simon Strainwood just sneaks in front of Gordon, Gordon Ray here. And for me, I think he's, I think he's took a, a little bit of a dive. It's hard to say, I mean, what chance have referees got? We're sitting watching action replays, and we're not certain. So it makes it very, very difficult for referees. But Tommy McQueen wasn't complaining. Slots at home and he gets a vital point for Falkirk. So it looks as though Falkirk uh, are going up to the Premier Division. Can they survive there? Well, I think like any club going up from the First Division to the Premier League, um, they're going to have to strengthen their squad. I mean, I know St Johnston has been a big success story since they came up, but generally it's a struggle. And it all depends on what kind of finance is available to Jim Jeffries when he, if, they, if they do go up, although there's still a few games to go. And if they can come up with some money for him, I think he's got to strengthen his squad and who knows. Now, your old club, Airdrie, uh, have a game in hand and uh, Dundee in there as well. It's going to be between them to go with Falkirk. Who do you think? Well, I've, I, I think I'll just tip Airdrie to go up because I think they've maybe got a little bit more experience than what Dundee have got, but it's going to be very tight and there'll be all the top three clubs, I think, will drop points between now and the end of the season because the nerves will start jangling. Very, very nervy running when, you know, that's when you're relying on experienced players and I think possibly Airdrie have got one or two more than what Dundee have got and that'll st stand them in good stead. Now, it was also a, a vital day in the Premier Division. Aberdeen are coming with a tremendous run. I think that's 19 out of the last 20 points. They're only slip up against Infermline uh, at Pitodry. Do you think they can come through and do it? Well, I mean, they've whittled, I mean, they've whittled the goal, goal difference right down. I mean, they've what, scored seven goals in the last two weeks. It was getting very, very interesting. I mean, we could see a situation that um, Aberdeen could be on to, going to Ibrox the last game of the season. I mean, a week or two it was looking like that, and they were going to have to Ibrox, go to Ibrox and win maybe four or five nothing. But it might, might be the case that Aberdeen can go to Ibrox now and any kind of victory could win them the championship. I don't expect either side to drop points between now and the end of the season. I mean, um, Aberdeen have got St Myrna away, St Johnson at home, and, and Rangers have got Dundee. Coming forward again. Away from Hughes. Murphy's in the other. Now it's Irvin for Meadowbank. Roseborough playing it the cross goal. Queen having to nip in quickly. Get the ball away from Kevin Kent. That might stir Falkirk into some kind of action. Here's McWilliams. Forward for that take. Good pass. The early cross. The chance. Oh, a tremendous goal by Eddie May. Well, excellent play by Falk.
Rebecca. A lovely ball played through into the path of Matty. Hit the first time cross and the powerful header from Eddie May into the back of the net. Jim Jeffries. Uh, a wee bit happier than that, perhaps, but uh, I know the old until the, the final whistle for his celebrations. Steve Cody in possession for Falker. Ball to Steenrod. Well, he did well to get the ball in from that angle. And again, the crowd applaud. They appreciate the skills of this man. It was Steve Cody firing the ball right across the face of goal and look at this angle <laughs> Williams again showing great pace and the ball headed behind by Graham Armstrong well a great first pace by Derek McWilliams catching the defence Getting to the line and getting in the cross, and Graham Armstrong did well under pressure. Heading behind, conceding the corner kick. In Rod with the outside of the foot. Godfrey's header just wide of the post. Well, a beautifully taken corner by Stain Rod, striking the ball with the outside of his right foot. And Godfrey's header just wide of the target. Williams. McQueen. The ball forward for McWilliams. The early cross again. And the goalkeeper did well under pressure from Crawford Batty. Lovely ball played through into the path of McWilliams. And again, the first time cross and the goalkeeper had to look lively played by Alan Prentice Logan switching it to Kevin Kane support from Tom Henry Ball, an awkward one for the goalkeeper. But he handled well under pressure. So just over 55 minutes gone. 3 0 to Falker. Stinrod, bring it off to me. Cody. Good turn by Bakhti. Oh, and a good shot as well. That was excellent play by Bakhti. Took the pass from Cody, turned the defender, and got in a very good shot indeed, which was well held by Jim McQueen. Lovely turn there, a good powerful shot. Nice ball by Taylor, through to Smith. Well, Taylor made up a lot of ground to get to that ball. He had been involved in the initial stages of the move, he's disappointed. Just off target with his shot, but there was Taylor really starting the move. Bringing the ball through to Gary Smith and then sprinting right across the edge of the penalty area. And the shot wide. Roseborough for Meadowbank with 65 minutes showing. going on the outside of the defender McQueen slides in and concedes the corner kick Boyd, Walter Boyd going forward into the pocket penalty area and Derek Grant has also moved forward to lend his height to the attack And the ball into the roof of the net. Uh, Meadowbank pull one back. 
65 minutes gone. The corner coming in, and Roseborough rising high above Marshall to put the ball into the roof of the net. David Roseborough's 16th goal of the season, leading scorer for Meadowbank. So Meadowbank making a substitution. Kevin Kane is the man going off. And Ian Little coming on. Challenge by John Hughes, but again, well held by the goalkeeper. Billy Irvin for Meadowbank. Played by Hughes. The best of clearances. by Godfrey. By McWilliams. Well, this will be a booking for Alan Prentice. Referee calling him over. has his name taken, the yellow card shown, first footing of the afternoon. Hughes with the free kick, Baptiste in there, and he scored again! Well, that was dreadful defending. But Trofa Dante gets his second goal of the game after 69 minutes. And it's now Falcon 4, Meadowbank 1. John Hughes with the long free kick. It appeared no great danger at all, but the header from Bapti, the goalkeeper, struggling at his right hand post. Well, Irvin looking for the ball, but well cut out by Taylor. Cleared by Hughes. And eluding the defender. And here's Bapti. Running straight into Graham Armstrong. One ball forward for Steve Wogan to chase, but right by McQueen, losing out though. And ball against John Hughes. Well, the penalty kick is awarded to Meadowbank. Steve Wogan sending the ball in, it came off the hands of John Hughes. So a chance for David. Roseborough to pull another one back. And he does it spectacularly. Falkirk for Meadowbank 2. The second goal for David Roseborough. That's his 17th of the season. So 74 minutes gone and right into the roof of the net. Well, a little bit of cheer for the travelling support. Queen, so headed away by Henry. Here's the chance now for Bapti. Well, the chance for him to complete his hat trick. It was well set up by Derek McWilliams. The ball had been partly cleared by Tom Henry. And just having to snatch at it a bit from the ball high and wide. Roseborough. 
Prentice too little. Long ball played forward by Prentice. Chance on here for Logan. Not a bad effort. Well, that was a good build up by Meadowbank. One of the better moves in the game. Played down the left. And then played into the path of Steve Logan. Armstrong. Good play again by Meadowbank. Banks committing himself forward. Losing out though. Killer running into trouble. Killer doing well. That is onside. Williams racing through the middle. Well, the referee says no penalty. So looked on that as an accidental flash. Well, it was good play again by Falkett. Bapte sending the ball back to McWilliams. No penalty is the referee. So the Falkett fans now singing their team to victory and to the championship. And another goal, but no doubt to like them just to finish it all off. Gary Smith topples to the ground. Referee waving play on. Taylor wins it well. Williams with a good run. He might go all the way himself, McWilliams. And the ball going behind Graham Armstrong with some help from goalkeeper Jim McQueen flossing a fine run by Derek McWilliams. And Armstrong doing just enough to get the ball behind for the corner kick. Given away by Armstrong. They've been getting the touch for Meadowbank as we move into injury time. Eddie May. There goes the final whistle. Falkirk are the first division champions. For the first time in their history, Crawford back to the man who opened the scoring. The fans pouring onto the field. Players swamped by the crowd. What an afternoon for Falkirk Football Club back in the big time. The final score here at Brockville Falkirk 4, Meadowbank 2. Congratulations, Jim. How does it feel to be champions and promoted? Oh, it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Players have worked hard, really, after a bad start. Some players going out, good ones coming in. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of the pressure, like there is with all the clubs at the top. But uh, just in the last couple of weeks, and we had a great performance today, but we were always a better side and could have won a lot more convincingly. But we did enough, and it's a reward for a great season, and all credit to everybody connected to the club. You won't forget this moment, will you? Never. It's uh, I played 15 years, but this is the, uh, you know, and I won the first division and I played with hearts, but. To win it as a manager is much more satisfying. This is the greatest day of my life. The first champagne clock has already popped, I think. Yes, uh, I'll go into the wee small hours, I think. Uh, but everybody, I mean, look at the fans today to turn out for this match. It just makes it great. And uh, I'm just delighted for everybody connected with the club. Enjoy yourself tonight. Well done again. Uh, you're a bit of a unique man because you've just collected your first division champions medal, which means you've got uh, the hat trick now. <laughs> first, second, and premier. Yeah, it's, it's a great day for me, but I'm far more pleased with the players at the club. Uh, winning the first division has been very important to us, and everyone here is delighted, as you can see. A great club spirit, but it has been all, all season, really, hasn't it? It has been right from I've come here. We've had a great team spirit, and I think it showed in the, the results we've had since then. It's been a great season. Simon, congratulations.
first year in Scotland and uh, not a bad start for you. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's not been a bad kick-up, has it? It's been, been a tense old time the last few weeks. And it's just such a relief to a winning league. You know, it's brilliant. Where did that relief come? Was it on Wednesday night or was it today? Today. I mean, football's a strange game and it can throw up all kinds of aspects. And uh, I'm just thrilled the bits that we won 4-2 or whatever. It was, uh, some of you won. You've had so much experience in the game without bringing your age into it. So many clubs. Yeah. How does today match up? Well, it's just every winning experience gets better. And like, especially the older you get, you, you cherish it even more. And this is, this is brilliant. It's the best feeling I can imagine. What about the future? Is it Premier Division with Falkirk for you? <laughs> it's up to the club. <laughs> I'm approachable, as Paul Elliott might say. <laughs> you might well. Congratulations again. Enjoy tonight. Thank you very much. It was a great day. Well done. So that means this season's league honours look like this. Rangers take the Premier Division title, Falkirk are First Division champions with Airdrie joining them in the step up and Second Division champions Stirling Albion accompany Montrose up into the First Division next season. Jerry, Gordon, how will you look back in the season I wonder? First yourself, Jerry. I think it was a better season than the previous one, but that wouldn't be difficult. I think we all owe a huge debt to Aberdeen. Their run was terrific. It wasn't enough in the end. I think they played the better football for, for long, long spells. But the one thing you can't do in this game, Jim, is argue with a completed league table. It shows Rangers won two games more and lost four goals less. It was an exciting finish, wasn't it, Gordon? No, it was terrific. I mean, it was a good season. The season started well. There was a lot of good football getting played early on in the season. But then when the weather deteriorated and the pitches got bad, um, the, the football did as well. The football suffered a bit as well. But as Jerry says, thanks to Aberdeen, we had a tremendously exciting run into the championship. And Falkirk go up, and of course, your old club, Airdrie, you'll be delighted for them. Yeah, it's sm smashing to see them up. Um, thoroughly deserved. But I think... Um, the Premier League, I mean, there's only five or six clubs capable of getting into Europe in the Premier League, so I think for Falkirk and Airdrie, it's all going to be all about survival next season. Do you think they'll stay up, Jerry, having gone up? Well, I think uh, the clubs that have come up uh, will have to invest heavily in new players. Just like the clubs that have survived, uh, thanks to reconstruction, uh, it's going to be mighty hard uh, down there in the lower reaches of the Premier Division next season. I must say, I worry about the standards next season, Jim. What about you, Gordon? Do you share that? Yeah, well, I think, um, as, as Jerry says, I mean, they need uh, massive, the likes of Falkirk and Airdrie need massive cash injections to, to really compete next year. And I'd, I'd presume they'd have tight budgets. So, as we say, it's going to be very, very tough for them because they're, they're really a split into two, the Premier League. Uh, a big question, Jerry. I mean, what about our European representatives? How well do you think they can do next season? Well, let's hope better than last season because uh, the season just finished. It was humiliation all round. Apart from Aberdeen, I thought Aberdeen were a wee bit unlucky to go out. Celtic are back in, having won less than half their Premier Division games, which is a bit of a shock, I think. But again, I think it shows that the lowering standards in the league. But let's hope that the representatives go in and do us proud just for a change. So see all of us. Jerry Gordon, thanks. Well, Barcelona suffered a setback yesterday in the build-up to their European Cup Winners' Cup final against Manchester United. They crashed 4-0 to bottom club Cadiz and still need a point for the championship. But there were title wins for Anderlecht in Belgium and Apollon in Cyprus. Ken McRobb now reports. Barcelona were without the injured Stoichkov and rested defender Nando for the visit to Cadiz. Strangely, they kept Zubi Zarata in goal. He misses Wednesday's final through suspension, which means his replacement, Busque, will make his first team debut against Manchester United. Yesterday, Barcelona found themselves behind after five minutes. Castillo is setting up Mejias to score. An incredible start for Cadiz, who are on course for the Spanish second division. Amazingly, Cadiz went two ahead 15 minutes later. Barla laying it on for Jose Quevedo. Argentinian international Oscar de Ticchia struck for third against a shell-shocked Barcelona before half-time. And three minutes into the second half, Cadiz made it 4-0. Quevedo racing away to get his second and leaving Barcelona boss Johan Cruyff with plenty to ponder over before his team meets Manchester United. Barcelona were also denied the point they needed to clinch the championship and they had to cancel a victory parade planned for the streets of the Catalan capital today. In Belgium, Anderlecht needed to win against Molenbeek in the Brussels derby to clinch the title. They did, courtesy of this goal by Marc de Grieze. Two minutes from time. Plenty then for the players to celebrate. And when the final whistle sounded, it was the signal for the rush from the bench and from the terracings. 
It was a special celebration with Anderlecht coming of age, their 21st championship win. In Cyprus, Apollo needed to beat Salamis to secure the title. This hat-trick by defender Christofi put them well on the way to the championship. He scored the second, third and fourth goals in their 5-2 victory. Again, the full-time whistle was the signal for mayhem. Apollon collecting the Cypriot League trophy for the first time. There's still a bit to go in the Bundesliga. Bayern Munich kept up their challenge yesterday. International defender Jürgen Kohler putting them ahead against Eintracht Frankfurt with 20 minutes left. Bayern made sure of the points only three minutes from time. Laudrup to Effenberg. And then the 1-2 with Grahammer, setting him up to make it 2-0. Kaisers Lauten and Werder Bremen both dropped a point, and so Bayern Munich move into second place, now three points off the lead. Still seven games to play. Thanks, Ken. In England, Sunderland had one last chance of first division survival when they went to Main Road to face Manchester City. Basically, they had to win to have any chance of staying up. Manchester City are in pale blue. The commentator is Martin Tyler. Gary Owens is waiting way beyond the far post, making his run now left for Pasco to take oh and the header was blocked with the goalkeeper betraying his inexperience it was Gabbiadini at the far post but this was the moment when hopes were raised so high for Sunderland for an electric start Gabbiadini couldn't squeeze in the header here's Quinn and David White who's so quick Norma started to come and he got the header in in those situations which are so perilous to goalkeepers now. If he brought White down then, Norman would have been sent off. But he made sure he got to the ball against one of the quickest players in the first division. And Quinn is onside. If he can get it down here, there's trouble for Sunderland who scores. Quinn after 10 minutes so this three-pronged attack pays dividend in as much as one of the strikers makes a goal here and takes it cleverly Quinn got the better of Kay and then had uh, a confrontation with Norman which he won as well Turning away from the goal, no back pass on. Davenport was working hard. And here's Hawk. Oh, and Pasco was unmarked just inside Warren Hawk, who uh, saw the chance of glory here from a difficult angle. You could see Pasco on the left of the pitcher screaming for the ball, which didn't come. Pasco put into play here with Kay. And goes Gabriel Dini! It's a thrilling goal for Sunderland! And there's hope again! Five minutes before half time. Great play between Pasco and Kay. And a cross that was met right on the meet by Marco Gabbiadini. John Kay has had to move to left back and he showed his aptitude for it with that storming run and what a great header Pasco who is a big influence at the moment Davenport and now Bennett can they play it right here not quite Gabbiadini tries to curl one Hendry got in the way the foul because Gabbiadini got to the ball as well as Poynton and Redmond's header is miscued it's gone behind for a corner will just be time for it to be taken it's a question now of how long Alan Gunn will add on he's just having a look at his watch we've had 45 minutes Bracewell Davenport Bennett Goal for Sunderland! And 
Gary Bennett has come back to Main Road. And put Sunderland into the lead in this frenetic period just before half-time. Davenport volleyed towards goal and Bennett made sure the ball went in via the goalkeeper. What a turnaround. It was mishit in truth by Davenport. It turned out to be a great cross. Sunderland are coming on strong. Point and throw. Heath. Hours miss kicks. And Quinn has equalised. Desperate moment for Hours. Two for Quinn. Two for Manchester City. And when Sunderland needed to keep calm, Hours tried to hook it away and put it on a plate for Quinn. And the way his season has gone, he's not missing gifts like that. It is half-time, and really it's hard to put a perspective on the 45 minutes here. It's been a, a good half for Niall Quinn, who put Manchester City in front and then equalised after Gary Bennett against his old club had got the second for Sunderland. Half-time at Main Road, it's Manchester City 2, Sunderland 2. Before you buy a new home, check out the range of mortgages at Bank of Scotland. There's more room to move, with a little help from your friends. Hey, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's too much bother. Yeah, come on, big man, don't give up. Why don't you go for the two Scottish electricity companies share offer? Well, I'm a very busy man. Come on, Brucey baby, register now for Scottish Power and Hydroelectric and you'll qualify for incentives. Ah, uh, I'm a wee bit short. But you can pay in three instalments. And as a customer, you only need as little as £100 for the first instalment in your local company. I must lose weight. I'm off the phone right away. To qualify for incentives, <coughs> register for a prospectus phone 0414141414. Most cats said their engines preferred them. I've been trying to learn German. I got one of these uh, cassettes that teaches you while you're asleep. I don't know, I don't know. I, I still can't speak the language, but I do dream with un... This chart reflects uh, in, in, at, a, at, a, at a high level of aggregation, because I don't want to give away too much information, but the main air defense sand belts in red circles, and then the circles going all around the country reflect their early warning capability at the beginning of the operation. An extremely large, sophisticated air defense system, principally with Soviet equipment, Soviet missile equipment, some French, some U.S. that was captured, 
as well as a very comprehensive system of trying to integrate all of those missile systems and gun systems, hardened command and control centers around the country. The fact of the matter is that we were able to attack this air defense envelope with great success over the last week by first taking out the early warning capability, blinding them, and then uh, going after the operating centers, the various sector operating centers that they use to wire this all together. And uh, for the most part, we have not been seriously affected by this very large air defense system. We have had a total of 10 aircraft lost, as you know. As we go through the analysis of how we lost those aircraft, at the moment, it appears we lost two by SAM fire, surface-to-air missile fire, and three more by ground fire, and the other five we're still taking a look at. But when you take a look at our total losses of only 10 U.S. aircraft, and I'll show you a chart here, I think. Uh, guess, here it is. Show you a chart there that, uh, um, well, it says SAM-1, AAA-3. I had it the other way around, maybe, but it's something close to that, and I apologize for the difference in numbers. When you take a look at the total of 16 aircraft losses for the coalition in its entirety, and you consider the number of combat sorties that have been flown and the numbers of single aircraft that are involved in this operation, somewhere between one and 2,000 aircraft, this is a very low loss rate for an operation of this type. Putting all that together, we can conclude that Allied Air Forces have achieved air superiority over not only the Kuwaiti theater of operations, but throughout the entire theater to include Iraq. We can debate whether it's air superiority as defined by American doctrine or air supremacy, as some of my British colleagues have alluded, or local air superiority, as some of my friends in Riyadh say. I used to teach the subject. I own the JCS publication that has the definition in it, which I helped write when I was a captain. And I can assure you that this qualifies for the definition of air superiority. When you can operate in an unhindered way, as we have been operating, over an area like this against an air force that size and with an air def defense system that sophisticated, we have achieved air superiority. That is not to say that a uh, young pilot who is taking off will say, Powell says we have air superiority, I've got nothing to worry about. Not at all. We're dealing with an enemy that is resourceful, an enemy that knows how to work around problems, an enemy that uh, is ingenious. You can be sure that while we're here today, they're in Baghdad trying to figure out workarounds, trying to determine where their weaknesses are and see if they have capability to fix those weaknesses. And every pilot that goes against this environment still has to be concerned uh, that he is going against an environment that has the potential of taking down his airplane. So we are not getting complacent. We are not writing this off. But in terms of how it looks at General Schwarzkopf's level and my level, we have air superiority. And with that air superiority, we can now begin to use our air forces to simply maintain this superiority and start to concentrate down closer to the Kuwaiti theater of operations, remembering once again our military objective is the Iraqi army in Kuwait. We have free run of the area as much as possible. Uh, there will still be losses, and I don't want to understate that, but in general, air superiority. Any pilot will tell you, though, that the real danger is guns. And as we get closer into the Kuwaiti theater of operations and our op tempo picks up, we will focus a great deal of our attention uh, knocking down the anti-aircraft gun threat to our pilots so that they can get even lower and make their strikes more effective as we go after discrete units on the ground in due course. General Colin Powell talking there in the Pentagon earlier this evening, concentrating very much uh, in, a, in the first section we're going to show of him talking about the successes against uh, the Iraqi uh, Air Force. Um, Air Vice Marshal Bryant, it was an extraordinary performance, I thought, really, wasn't it? I mean, he... he, he spun his audience, kept his audience al alive and going, had fascinating things to say. He delivered it in an inter interesting way. Uh, and at uh, one stage he said, I can assure you this qualifies for the description of air superiority. But then he very quickly sort of reined himself in, didn't he, and said, we mustn't be complacent in effect. Mm. Uh, the enemy is a genius, is what he, what he went on to add. So I suppose the question is this, 
Is there some sort of horrible question lurking at the back of your mind? Why hasn't the Iraqi Air Force come out to engage? Right. Can I just first agree with you? I think that was an excellent briefing. It was riveting because it was true. Um, and it, it had the ring of truth about it. Uh, and also, as an airman, of course, I find it exciting because if you read a textbook on how to commence an air campaign, then you have just heard the text. Uh, it, it is going uh, absolutely according to the classic concept of the employment of air power. Now, uh, air superiority. I also taught air superiority when I was commandant at our staff college, but I would not cross semantic swords with the good general. He said there was a slightly different interpretation well, there of is. British and American. There, there is. In, in fact, I think we would say at the moment that we have created a favourable air situation, which, as he said, is the important thing in practice. Uh, but with um, you know seven or eight hundred aeroplanes lurking on the ground, I, I would hesitate to say yet that we have c created air superiority. And that brings me on to your actual question about why and, and what does it indicate. It could indicate that um, Saddam Hussein is deliberately um, hiding his aeroplanes um, and ensuring that they survive in, in large number in their concrete shelters in order to use them at a later date. And probably the timing for that would be um, when the land campaign starts, if it starts, uh, when they would have maximum effect. It could, however, be that 